Welcome. Uh, we're tonight is a special uh, free class um, called Emotional Anatomy. Um, I actually presented this uh, a, a simpler version of this to uh, the people who are members of my member program uh, last year, and I am going to um, uh, uh, be giving you this kind of overview of this. I'm I'm going to be teaching a a uh, full-length webinar class on this, but what I'm going to be presenting to you tonight is really sufficient to understand uh, the basic concepts of the whole uh, system that I've used for 25 years in terms of understanding the body and, and helping me read the body and helping me identify um, what's going on with people on an emotional level. So, you know, we we hear about a lot in modern society that there is a mind-body connection, that there is a, uh, a link between what's going on in our head, in our thoughts, and uh, what's going on with our physical health. And there's a whole um, field of subject study called psychoneuroimmunology, which studies the relationship between a person's psychology, their thought processes, and, and uh, their nervous system function and their immune system function. Well, I long ago figured out, as I'm going to explain tonight, that emotions are the mind-body connection, that emotions are the bridge between the body and the mind. Um, I'm going to show you why I believe that. And But, it, but I find that uh, most systems of healing are targeted primarily towards the mind, and I've gone after looking uh, straight after the emotions and, uh, and trying to read that. It's all about energy. Uh, we, you know, Einstein's little theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, basically says that, that matter and energy are synonymous, that energy is a, uh, matter is a form of energy, and so everything we see is composed of energy, so it is energetic processes that are basically running everything. Life is a process of energy. A dead body is a, a body that basically loses its energy. I can tell people the difference between a live body and a dead body is the one moves and the other one doesn't. So it's the movement, the motion, the vibration that creates the life force. And that movement, motion, and vibration includes the, the thought processes and also the, the vibrations of our emotions and our feelings. So many years ago, I realized that if everything is composed of energy and energy is vibration, that vibrations move in waves, waves of expansion and waves of contraction. And so um, the Orientals express this in the philosophy of the yin and the yang, the, the uh, polar energies. And the way I came to, to see this is that yin is the energy that, uh, of attraction, like gravity and magnetism. And it, as anything that pulls into itself, is going to expand. So when the heart expands, it pulls in the blood. When the lungs expand, it pulls in the air. Um, it, the, that expansion cr creates fullness and draws things toward it. Um, the opposite part of a wave is contraction, and contra as something contracts, it pushes energy and so forth away from it. So our, our heart is beating in waves of expansion and contraction. Our lungs are, are pulsing and breathing patterns of expansion and contraction. Our nerves are building up an electrical uh, charge and discharging an electrical charge, which is another waveform of expansion and contraction. And there is a third force in all of this. Um, and that is equilibrium. The heart just doesn't go expand, contract, expand, contract, expand, contract. It goes expand, contract, and pause. Uh, and same thing with your lungs. You breathe in, you exhale, and you pause. You breathe in, you exhale, you pause. There's a pause or a resting place. And this basically forms the, the basis of all of the energetic uh, systems that I use to try to understand things and, and, and put things together. So the the yin force or the feminine force is the force of attraction, um, just as the uh, and the yang force is the force of contraction or the masculine force, and then there's also a force of equilibrium or balance that's the neuter force. And everything that I'm going to present to you tonight is built on this idea of these basic forces, that everything is composed of energy, since energy follows in waves, and these waves um, uh, basically are governed by these forces of 
building up, you know, expansion, um, discharging, contraction, and then rest, you uh, basically see this pattern of expansion, contraction, and equilibrium everywhere in the universe and everything we observe and everything we look at. In the body, these three forces express themselves um, with what I call the ABC principles of healing, activate, build, and cleanse. The idea of assimilation, elimination, and regulation. Basically, the body has to take in nutrition, the body has to discharge waste, and the body has to regulate um, the life processes. And those three forces are at work in, in the physical body. And there are three um, systems that permeate all the tissues of the body. Basically, if you look at the body, nearly every part of the body has blood vessels uh, bringing uh, blood uh, to it, um, and it also has lymphatic capillaries um, and lymphatic fluid, and almost every part of the body is also innervated. So these three systems that the blood, you know, bringing the nourishment and also removing some of the waste, and then the lymph system being uh, part of the immune system and part of the waste removal system, uh, and then the nervous system regulating everything. Basically, you see this principle in operation in the body um, with those three systems. So we're going to look at uh, an application of this concept and. Uh, using the seven uh, sacred directions. This is a concept that comes uh, from Native American traditions, but it's basically present around the world in a lot of different places. Um, and basically, if you think of where you stand, there are, um, there are really only six basic directions you can go, forward and backward, right and left, or up and down. And then the seventh direction is towards the center, in other words, the, the seventh direction is the center point or the starting point. So you can also express this as north, south, east, and west, or up or down. But basically, um, the, some combination of those trajectories basically enables you to, to move in three-dimensional space. So the idea of the seven sacred directions we're going to use to help understand uh, the body and how the body relates to energy. And we're going to start by looking at the fact that the body has a front and the body has a back. And, and we have those three forces operating in, um, in this dimension of, of, of uh, movement, because we have you know, backward uh, and we have forward, and we also have the center. So that's your expansion, contraction, and equilibrium. And this has to do a lot with um, uh, what is ahead of us and what is behind us. In other words, what is what is in uh, in front of us, or what what is uh, what we leave behind. And so this has is a future, past um, axis in the body. Generally speaking, when you have pain and problems that involve the back side of the body, you're looking at burdens of unresolved emotional issues from the past. When you have pains that are more towards the front of the body, they're more uh, either current or they're related to anxiety or fear uh, or, or problems uh, projecting ahead into the future. So um, you can kind of uh, assess you know, when people are coming to you where some of their emotional issues are, and you'll see that, um, that a lot of the things that people have in their back relate to things from the past. For example, one of the things that I've encountered a lot in emotional healing is that there is really such a thing as being uh, energetically stabbed in the back. Um, when, when we feel betrayed, um, that someone has not watched our back or whatever, um, you can basically get an energy wound or an emotional wound that creates uh, tension and pain, usually somewhere in the area of the shoulder blades and between the back, and this will often manifest as uh, a problem with back pain. Also, when people are carrying a lot of burdens of the past, it tends to slump their shoulders and can cause headaches and uh, other uh, problems like that, uh, whereas in contrast, the more uh, frontal things 
often relate to worry or current stress or anxiety, which uh, again is usually uh, being concerned about the future. People's posture basically reveals a little bit about how they deal with this. Essentially, um, we are made to stand erect so that the bones of our skeletal structure basically carry the weight of our body from the ground uh, clear up to our head. So uh, essentially, when, when the weight is distributed across the spinal column and then divided by the pelvis going down the legs, there, there is a, a nice uh, clear distribution of weight going all the way down so that none of the muscles of the body are stressed. And we're again talking about the forward, um, backward axis of the body. Most people in our society, if you watch them walking, they lean forward as they walk. So in other words, you, you'll see if you watch most people moving around, they do not stand upright. Instead, they basically are, are, um, are bending kind of forward, their head tends to tilt forward, and their body tends to slump forward. The problem with this is that it is when you're doing that, if like especially if your head is tilting forward, then you have uh, you, the weight is not being carried along the spinal column and through the bones. Instead, the muscles have to carry the weight. So as you see that head tipping forward, the muscles in the neck basically have to hold the weight of the head up against the force of gravity, and that puts a great deal of um, uh, uh, tension in those uh, particular muscles. And, um, um, and that basically uh, causes those muscles to fatigue and creates pain and stress. Well, part of the reason that we tend to lean forward is because psychologically in our society we're all rushing ahead. In other words, we're, we're, we're trying to run into the future. We're in a hurry to, to move forward in our, in our consciousness. And often we're also carrying uh, on our back a load of unresolved emotional stress from the past, and we are, are are kind of running, trying to run away in the future to escape the burden of the past. So we're not really fully presently engaged in the world, standing straight or erect or tall. We're we're basically um, kind of have this leaning forward. So you can you can see that um, posture. Also um, the the tail, the pelvis, has a lot to do with the emotion of shame, and a lot of people, um, in being shamed, they tuck in their tail, which basically what happens is the pelvis kind of uh, is pulled uh, back um, a little bit, and uh, or sometimes sometimes it's pushed forward a little bit, but basically that means the pelvis is also not in proper alignment with the body, and that a lot of times has a lot to do with uh, people's, um, like I say, being, shame, be, being shamed, and uh, often with sexual issues or or uh, abuse or or issues with uh, a person's sexuality or sensuality. Now, if we look at the right left side of the the body, the the right side of the body is the side of contraction, the left side is the side of expansion, and again the midline is the point of equilibrium or balance between these two, two things. The, the right side is the side that, that is pushing out energy, the, the yang side, the left side is the, the side that's receiving energy, the yin side. Um, I learned this a long time ago with uh, working with some polarity and energy work. Um, but also, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, in rayed iridology, they basically look at the iris and, and your markings in your left eye relate to your mother's side of the family, and the markings in the right eye relate to your father's side of the family. And um, also, there, the right side of the body, um, as I'll show in a little bit, is all about uh, these masculine energy ten tendencies of things that create separation or force 
or, or uh, pull things apart, whereas on the left side you have the, the energies of drawing together or, or pulling things inward. Ideally, there needs to be a balance between these two, um, and, but very few people have that balance. So we also tend to get a lot of side-to-side -side distortion in our body. In fact, the most common distortion of the way people stand is people tend to um, be in our culture left brain dominant. Um, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But since the left um, uh, brain, and I'm, I'm, I, what I'm talking about is someone just asked a question. I'm talking about the patient's um, left and right. In other words, the I'm talking about uh, not the therapist's point of view of left and right, but the actual person's left and right. So um, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So if, you're, if we're overtrained in the left brain, which we are, and we tend to use our left brain far more than our right brain, then what happens is, since the left brain controls the right side of the body, we tend to use the right side of our body more freely than we use the left side of the body. So 90% of the public tends to stand with their weight primarily on their left leg to leave the right side of their body more free to move, which then compresses the left leg elongates the right leg, throws the pelvis out of balance, and basically creates a, a curve or, again, a distortion in the way the bones hold the body erect in the present moment um, going up uh, the spine. So these are some pictures I just grabbed off a website I used for pictures on the Internet, and you can see it um, uh, shows different uh, people. One, she, she is standing with her weight on her right leg, but the other two are standing with their weight on their left leg. And you can see how that can distort, and uh, chiropractors are all the time you know, working on fixing this. Um, I actually found that um, if you notice that you're standing on one leg, shift the weight to the other leg, and then shift the weight back to the weight where the weight is evenly proportioned. And if you actually practice doing that, your uh, pelvis will come into better alignment, and you'll also be more um, uh, present. So this is basically showing this concept of the two sides of the brain. Uh, the left brain tends to process in a logical, sequential, analytical method. It's the verbal brain that basically uses words and language. Um, it's rational, practical, uh, thinks in kind of scientific slash mathematical terms and strategies, is oriented towards the past and is very compartmentalized. In other words, everything is categorized, labeled, pigeonholed, blah, 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 which is very useful for solving problems, uh, uh, you know, because if you uh, categorizing things, etc. But we also have a, another side of us that's intuitive, holistic, creative, um, visual and symbolic rather than uh, verbal. That's more imaginative, impetuous, artistic, philosophical, that thinks in terms of possibilities and also connections. Rather than compartmentalizing things, it associates things. Um, in fact, that's what the, the process of, of creativity is, is associating things that were not previously associated and seeing connections where people have not seen connections before. Um, so basically, we overtrain the left brain, and most of the things that train the right brain, such as art, music, uh, physical education, dance, uh, and those kinds of things, have been you know, way cut and underfunded in our public education system and are downplayed as being less important than uh, language and mathematical, mathematics, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, uh, and so forth. And therefore, we develop this lopsidedness in our culture, um, this lopsided energy, and it affects the physical body, as I've just shown, by knocking our, us out of alignment. The interesting thing, though, is if you come into better structural alignment, um, you will um, basically uh, actually help to balance both sides of your brain and use both sides of your brain better. A couple of people, two people have reported that they're getting a little bit of cutting in and out of words. 
that happens sometimes um, on when the internet connection is a little fuzzy. Um, but usually, if it's if if it's happening on my end, it'll be a whole bunch of people that will suddenly date it, and I'll get a message that there's a problem. Uh, otherwise, it's typically on the receiver end, and uh, there's really nothing I can do about it um, because it's just an internet thing. Fortunately, it doesn't show up on the recordings, so if you're having a hard time with it, um, it should it it won't won't show up on the recordings. Um, okay, so. Uh, basically, as I've indicated, the um, uh, I guess yeah, there's a couple of people who are uh, getting choppiness. Um, so, like I said, it's it's in the the internet thing. I didn't have it last night, um, and I haven't been having it recently in most of the webinars I've been doing. So I'm not sure what's going on with the uh, the the choppiness because. Um, uh, it's not something I have control over on my end. Um, uh, okay, so the right right side of the brain uh, is the the masculine side of our energy. It sends energy. It basically the, the 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 right side of our body, which is the left side of our brain, is the side that is the more masculine side. It sends energy. It protects us. On that side, we have the liver energy, which is detoxification, the thymus energy, which is immunity, the uh, left brain is uh, uh, choppiness, and this is also uh, patterned by our relationship with our father. And for all of you who are having some problems, I just let me know, like I apologize, but like I said, on my end, I have no way to to, to fix that if there's a disruption in the internet. It's one of the problems with the internet. Um, uh, and hopefully it will, it usually doesn't last. Um, hopefully it'll clear up. Um, anyway, so the left side of the brain is the feminine side of our nature. It receives energy. It opens up um, the pancreas, which is you know pleasure and nourishment, heart, love, and joy. The right brain intuition, and this is also patterned by the mother side of the, the family. So there's that's that's basically the alignment to to uh, right or left. So the left iris is connected to the right brain. The right iris is connected to the left brain, um, and the, side, the two sides of the brain connect to the opposite sides of the body. Now, so that, that's the right-left axis. Then we have a horizontal axis, an up and down axis in the body. And that up and down axis, which is the, the third direction, has we have three worlds or three um, sections in our, our body. So we have uh, a chamber up in our skull that houses our brain. We have a chamber in our chest that it houses our heart and lungs. We have a chamber in our abdomen that houses our digestive organs. So we have these three worlds, which is the world of our mind, the world of our heart, and the world of our guts. And we actually have three brains, really, that govern these three different worlds. Uh, in other words, we have three ways of processing information and processing the world on these three different levels. We all understand our, our mental brain, but we also have uh, nerve cells in the heart. And there's a whole uh, emerging science about this, uh, heart math. You can look that up on the Internet. Uh, talks about this. But the nerve cells in the heart think independently of the nerve cells in the brain, and that basically emotions are... Uh, basically uh, the thinking processes of the heart, which is actually creating an electromagnetic wave that influences the entire body and, uh, and everything that's going on in the system. And then we also have a whole lot of neurotransmitters and a whole other kind of brain slash nervous system in our intestinal tract, which is called the enteric um, nervous system. And the guts produce a tremendous amount of neurotransmitters that affect our mood and our emotions. And so that's why we have something called gut instinct. So if you think of these three parts of our uh, psychology, they've been called by a lot of different names, the parent, the adult, the child, 
the super ego, the ego, and the id, uh, mind, spirit, and body. But we basically have this triune nature, and the heart world sits in the middle. The heart world is a world of equilibrium. It maintains equilibrium or keeps the balance between what's going up on our head and what's going down in our physical body. So if you look at a lot of the kind of stories and things that people like, they reflect this thing. I mean, the, the good old story of the Wizard of Oz. The scarecrow is looking for a brain, the tin man's looking for a heart, the cowardly lion's looking for courage, for guts, see? The stories like this basically appeal to something deep inside of us because they relate to, you know, our psychology. Even uh, the popularity of Star Trek, you sort of see this mirrored in the three principal characters in the original Star Trek. Spock was the, you know, the guy who's all mind, okay? And uh, McCoy was the one who was kind of the heart. Captain Kirk was the guts, you know, the hero, the courage, you know, charge in and so forth. Um, although, although Captain Kirk sort of stood in the middle between the, the emotional and the, and the mental with Spock. This, the body is holographic in nature, meaning that Every part reflects this pattern of the whole. So like I said, this, this concept is found over and over again, repeated everywhere you look. So basically, if you uh, look on the face, you have the same pattern repeated on the face. The upper part of the head is the brain world. The middle part of the face or head is the heart world. And the lower part is the, the body world. Okay? And so... Cartoonists understand this. There's an intuitive thing. When you draw a caricature, okay, the, the guy on the uh, left side, the egg head that has the really wide, big forehead and everything and the really narrow, skinny jaw, we wouldn't think of this person as being a physically powerful person, but we would think them as being definitely very mental or very intellectual because they're the the shape of their head denotes that their energy tends to reside up in their brain and the narrowness of their jaw means they don't have a lot of power in their in the physical world in their physical body whereas if you look at the caricature on the other side you immediately think of there's just a really uh, masculine physically strong presence because the wide jaw which is in the the uh, physical world basically denotes a lot of physical power, and then the narrower forehead is not as much, you know, mental power or mental capacity. So we, we, we see this Santa Claus is drawn with big, puffy, rosy cheeks and his face round, which means it's kind of whitest in the middle, which is the heart world, because he's jolly and he's happy and he's giving and he's caring. You couldn't draw Santa Claus like the uh, either of these two other guys because it wouldn't fit with what we assigned to the personality of Santa Claus. So um, uh, even in the way we do this in car caricature, we do this. Plus, the sensory systems are divided into these three worlds. Um, the eyes basically are up at the top, and they primarily are the doorway into the mental world. The ears come down next on the face, and they are primary the doorways into the emotional world. And then, of course, the sense of touch is the doorway into the, the uh, physical world. Your nose and your mouth, the, the mouth sort of is the junction between the, the, the emotional and the, the physical world and the nose between the mental and the emotional world. We talk about the nose, nose. But you see notice how the senses are laid out on that pattern. We have two eyes, one nose, two ears, uh, one mouth, and then we also have two hands. Um, and that pattern is uh, the pattern of the tree of life, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So as I mentioned, the eyes are the doorway to the mental world, the ears are the doorway to the emotional world, the hands are the doorway to the physical world, and the nose sits at the junction um, and of between the mind and the heart, which relates to the throat or neck, and the mouth its junction between the heart and the body, which is the solar plexus. There are also three major learning types. Basically, um, 
people who tend to be more mental tend to be visual learners. They have an attitude of show me. I, they want to see it. They want to see it in writing. They want to see a picture. They want to see a chart. They want to see a graph, something like that. People who are more emotional or feeling oriented tend to be auditory learners. They learn best by hearing. And then there are also kinesthetic people who learn by touch and movement. So those three types of learners, again, correspond to these three major worlds of our, our being. I learned a little uh, trick uh, some time ago that basically the, the way a person shifts their eyes um, when they're thinking shows you which world they're accessing. So in other words, if you say, uh, can you remember you know, your first date, and the person shifts their eyes up um, as, they're, as they're thinking, they're accessing visual memory. They're, they're visualizing the first date. If they're moving over to the side, they tend to be auditory. They're, they're thinking about it more in terms of what was said or, or whatever. And then kinesthetic goes back down into the more feeling thing, and, and the kinesthetic looks downward. Um, whether they look to the left or the right has to do with whether they're imagining into the future or whether they're thinking about the past. In other words, if you ask a question about that causes someone to envision the future, they'll look one direction. If you cause, ask them to think about the past, they'll look the other direction. But whether they're accessing that on an auditory, visual, or kinesthetic level will determine whether or their eyes shift up or over or down. So this whole energy, but what I'm doing is showing you how this energy pattern repeats itself over and over again throughout our being. So in rayed iridology, um, they recognize three basic types, the jewel, the flower, and the stream. And I found this to be extremely accurate. The jewels are the mental types or the visual learners. And uh, they uh, tend to have lots of little spots in their eyes. The flowers are the emotional types, and they tend to have rounded openings in their eyes. And then you have the streams, which are the physical kinesthetic types, and they tend to have uh, an absence of markings. The, there's a fourth type called um, the shaker, which basically is a mixed type, um, which has uh, elements of, of two or more of these patterns in it. And those are, are people who have multiple learning uh, patterns. But basically, everybody has a dominant way that they learn. I'm an auditory learner, dominantly. So, um, so forth. So, 25 years ago, as I was, you know, starting to, to put this together, I basically uh, uh, had a friend, uh, met, a, met a guy named Royland Mortensen, and uh, he taught me about the uh, Tree of Life, which is a model from the Hebrew tradition, except that Royland restored the, the tree. If you go and study this on the internet, you'll find that that um, one of the spheres is diverted downward and the paths are not symmetrical in the way this is typically re recommended. He actually restored it to this symmetrical form. And basically, uh, I learned about this. And if you're interested in learning about this, there is a... Um, uh, I, I need to repost it, but I did a webinar with him, and I'm going to repost it at uh, my personal website, stephenhorn.com. But he also has a website, uh, a blog called cobbaloni.com, if you want to learn more about his, his model. But basically, this model, I've been kind of giving you elements of it, but it's basically a holographic thing. Okay? In other words, within each of these worlds that I just explained, we have this holographic uh, representation of, of these energies. So for example, in the world of our head, we have the back of our head, the middle of our head, and the front of our head. And we also have a, a right, left, center dichotomy in our head. So basically, you, you have these three energies existing in each of the three worlds of our being. Um, and so this is the basis of my system of emotional anatomy. And how this came to be uh, actually was a, was a two-fold um, thing for me. The first um, uh, impression I had about this actually came to me one morning when I had been studying this tree, and I literally woke up, and in 
a matter of, of a few of a minute or two, I just was downloaded this understanding. I saw the two eyes, the one nose, the, the, the two ears, the one mouth. I saw the three worlds. I saw the holographic pattern. I saw the whole thing. And I started working with it with people and using it as a way of, of, of trying to figure out where their emotional issues were. And I originally did this using muscle testing. In other words, I would muscle test these. Uh, I would hold my hand over these various parts of the body and muscle test and find out where the body's energies were weak. And then I would um, go in and try to figure out what was making the weak energy a thing in the body. And I found this model to be, uh, over the course of 25 years, to be incredibly accurate, incredibly right on in terms of the kinds of things that came up when a person had an energy weakness in one of these parts of the body. And so that's basically what I'm going to explain to you with the rest of this evening, is how this particular um, energetic model works. So we're going to start down in the world of our guts, okay? The physical world, okay? So the, the world of our guts is the abdominal cavity, and the abdominal cavity is uh, I think of this world as the world of our inner child. Our body is like our inner child. We have to take care of it. The, the body has appetites. The body has needs. The body wants to have sex. The body wants to eat. The body wants to sleep. The body wants to drink. The body wants to do things. All of our, our, our physical appetites, our drive for survival, um, uh, what we call passion and instinct and so forth, reside in this world. Now, remember, since this is holographic, there's also the lower part of our brain also links into this lower part of our body, and it's where we have these, you know, instincts. Sexual attraction, for example, comes from this level of our being. Um, it, uh, the, the, the will to survive, which is a very deep seated um, uh, thing in us, the, the passion to want to stay alive or to fight for our lives or whatever, comes from this very deep-seated part of our being. Um, it's, uh, and that part of our brain is called the reptilian part of our brain. So we have gut instincts. We have a gut knowingness that, that basically... Um, if we let that part of our world dominate completely, it can be pretty destructive because we can engage in in uh, very self-centered, uh, very egocentric uh, behavior. All of our, all of us, as children, start out completely egocentric. I mean, I've never seen a child who, you know, uh, an infant who waking up with their diaper wet or or being hungry in the middle of the night thinks, "Oh, mom needs their sleep. I won't cry." Okay, they cry, and you, as the parent, have to go take care of them. I mean, the, the whole their whole being is geared towards their own self and their own egocentricity, and hopefully we mature and we grow out of that as we get older. But still, that part of us is always there. There is a need for care of the self. So, um, over the belly button is where the place of balance is in this world, and that sits right over the small intestines. And if you think about um, what the belly button is, it's the connection to mother. It's where we were joined to mother in our womb, and through that um, little hole in our abdomen, we received all of the nourishment for the time that we were gestating in our mom's womb. And then we were separated from our mom, and our mom became, hopefully we had a healthy mom, and mom became the caregiver, and we, uh, she nursed us and changed our diapers and, and so on and so forth. And we had that nurturing or that mater the, uh, maternal material, notice the relationship between those words, uh, nurturing. Our physical needs were taken care of, as well as hopefully some of our emotional needs. That sits right over the small intestines. The small intestines in Chinese medicine are called the sifters and sorters. They're basically deciding what to absorb into the body and what to, to move on down the, the pipeline to get rid of. So basically, 
that is the, the point of equilibrium or balance. That's also where the, the gut brain resides, is in that the neurotransmitters in that small intestine. Um, when people have disturbances in their relationship with their mom, when they didn't get their physical needs well met in childhood, they have an emotional wound at that navel energy. That emotional wound at that navel energy can set up all kinds of digestive problems. In other words, problems with being able to, to, to nurture myself and feel like I deserve the, the nourishment and, um, uh, and things that I need. So I found over and over again that uh, this connection between digestion and mother uh, and being mothered, being nurtured, in other words. So when people have wounds there, they either can become kind of very greedy, uh, always seeking to get things, material, to try to fill their need, or they can become very self-sacrificing, like trying to prove that they're good enough to deserve what they need. Um, the liver is the the yang or the masculine side of this world. And the liver is the primary organ of internal detoxification. It's also a warehouse for nutrients and processes nutrients uh, to deliver them in the blood. But it but it is a, a place where the the body helps protect itself. It acts as a second line of defense. Whatever is absorbed off of the digestive tract goes up through the portal vein into the liver where the liver examines it and can basically try to get rid of things that were absorbed that shouldn't have been absorbed and also process the nutrients to go out to the rest of the body. In both traditional uh, uh, oriental medicine, medicine and traditional western medicine, the liver is associated with anger. Anger is how we protect ourselves. Anger is how we defend ourselves. The liver is there as an organ that's helping to defend us. And it's on the right side of the body, which indicates the masculine side of the body, which is the energy of being able to create force or push things away or separate things and, and, and keep things at bay. So in the physical world, we have this, this detoxification or elimination energy, um, which is associated with anger and the ability to stand up for ourselves and say no and fight back. And then we have opposite that, the pancreas, which secretes enzymes to break down food for our nourishment and also regulates our blood sugar, which has to do with our, our experience of life being sweet. So I found that on that side of the abdomen, the, the pancreas was the energy center that I found was associated with uh, what I call the playful inner child, meaning the ability to receive pleasure. Anger allows us to say no to pain. It allows us to push things away that aren't good for us. The, the opposite energy to that is the energy that allows us to say yes to pleasure. It lets us wiggle our toes in the mud and play with our food and be silly and laugh and, and, and goof around and have a good time. And when we are not able to do that, when we don't feel like we're able to do that, we lack sweetness in our life. We lack joy. Um, and this basically... Um, uh, creates a thing. Not, slides aren't changing because I'm still talking about this particular slide. So basically that um, is the, oh, well, I, you know what, I, sh I, I should just go. So anyway, I, so the physical center um, is the, the liver, which is the ability to detoxify uh, the body um, and basically eliminate substances that are uh, damaging, energetically fight back. It's the uh, emotional seat of anger, irritation, hatred, aggression, and so forth. And I guess when I moved this from one computer to the other, it kind of like used a different way in the font, so it's going down a little farther, but hopefully in the notes you can read that. Anyway, so the pancreatic center on the opposite side represents the Chinese spleen chi, the ability to build up. Remember, you have cleansing, you have building. Say the 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 spleen chi in Chinese medicine is the ability to turn the food we eat into muscle, into tissue. And, um, and so that's an opposite energy to detoxification. And this is about you know, getting what I want, having joy, having happiness, and, and so forth. Um, sugar and spice and everything nice. When I've worked on healing people with wounds in this area, um, they usually as children were, were punished for 
uh, laughing or playing or whatever, so they feel guilty about in, enjoying life, or they, you know, were preached, you know, how sinful pleasure was or whatever. So um, they have an imbalance in that. And then that third center, which is the the place of balance, the intestines are the sifters and sorters in Chinese medicine. That's the gut instinct, the ability to get what we need, to, to basically take care of us. That's the balance between those two forces of getting rid of what we don't want and basically um, getting what we do want. So it's basically the emotional center of mothering or nurturing where the child uh, uh, within gets cared for by me as an adult. If, if I don't get cared for as a child, then I, like I say, may as an adult have difficulty with self-care, meaning I may feel guilty for taking care of myself, and so I may become a people pleaser or a martyr or an enabler and try to take care of everybody else and to the neglect of myself. So those are the three primary energies in the physical world of our being. And uh, like I said, over and over again, I have found that this consistently played out. Um, that that when I muscle tested people and they were weak in these areas of their body, uh, not only did they have health problems that tended to match this, but when we got into doing the healing work, you know, issues and things came up in their life that were related to this these three uh, patterns that I've just explained. So. If we move upward in the uh, 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 pattern, we come into the emotional or heart world. And we have the same pattern again of the three energies, um, the one being at the throat, the other one being on the right side of the chest, and the other one being on the left side of the chest. So I call these the 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 throat uh, energy, the heart energy, and the thymus energy. Um, in the traditional seven chakra system, the heart chakra is, you know, in the center of the chest, but I kind of, in this system, saw that there was a difference. There's like two parts of the heart. The Chinese talk about the heart, and then they also talk about the heart protector. Um, in other words, the defender of the heart. And the thymus sits over the heart, and the thymus can be thought of as the heart protector because it's the seat of immunity. This world of emotions, emotion is the social world. The, the physical world is my own body, my own selfish you know, need, my own inner child. The emotional world <coughs> is my interaction with others. The emotional world is... Uh, it, all of our relationships with each other are really governed by feeling. We want to be around people that we feel uh, good with, and we want to avoid people that we feel bad with. So we're, emotions drive our social relationships. Emotions create our social relationships. The, the mammalian brain, which is the next higher up brain center, is also the part of our brain that governs this area of our being. Um, in our in our brain, and the mammalian brain has to do with basically the idea of friendship, um, of uh, and it's not just about instinct anymore. It's about you know creating warm and fuzzy feelings or 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 good values. So this is kind of like I say the the adult world of ourself. So again, we have these three <coughs> energies on the the right side, moving up from the liver we have what I call the thymus energy. So the, the liver deals with kind of gross detoxification. In other words, you know, getting rid of chemical poisoning and uh, stimulating the, the bowels to go and processing toxins for elimination in the, in the kidneys and the colon. But the thymus basically programs the immune system to say what is self and what is not self. Um, and it's, it's this energy that deals with the idea of the I am. What am I? Self-worth. Self People who tested weak in this area of the body tend to have issues with self-worth. Um, 
they 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 have issues with not being able to clearly define uh, who and what I am. And also they lack a sense of what is socially appropriate and what is not socially appropriate. And this relates to this idea of immunity. The basic thing of immunity is what is self, what is not self, what is good for self, what is not good for self. And that's being able on a, on a higher level of interacting with other creatures, microbes and stuff, not chemicals, but microbes and other living things and other human beings, to decide what should be here and what shouldn't be here, what's friendly to me and what's not friendly to me. I've seen many cases where the damage to the self-esteem creates a damage to the functioning of the immune system so that basically when a person doesn't feel good about themselves, they don't have a good sense of self-worth or whatever, their immune system doesn't work very properly. They may get autoimmune disorders, they may get frequent infections or so on and so forth, all because this um, uh, inability to helpfully distinguish self um, from not self. Opposite that is the heart center. Um, and the heart center basically is the part that opens us up. So we have a thing that says, you know, no, I don't want to associate with that person, or I, or I don't want this particular creature living in my body, or I don't want to get out. And then the other side says, yeah, I do. I want to let you to be close to me. I want to open up, and I want to feel love, and I want to experience closeness and intimacy and so forth. And we definitely associate that with the heart, and we definitely feel that on the left side of our body um, more than we feel it on the right side of the body, even though the heart and the thymus are both actually in the middle, we feel that heart pain on the, on the left side. So this is where the, the blood is, you know, basically physically nourishing all of our bodies, but of our body, but it also represents the ability to create connection. Um, that's why when when someone betrays us, it hurts our heart. When we lose someone we love, we feel heartache. Um, we, we, we feel uh, open-hearted or compassionate to people. We feel love, mercy, kindness, empathy, which is the opposite from, again, this. Uh, uh, the thymus center is the judgment center. The heart center is the mercy center. Uh, and those two are, are opposing energies within our being that basically one is wanting to push people away and the other one is wanting to let people be close. Um, so someone just said, it's an interesting question, would the area of the thymus be affected when a person is in an abusive relationship and loses their self-worth? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why they stay. That's why they can't get out of that relationship or push that person away is because they no longer have that enough power of self-worth to basically want to create a separation or to push themselves away from something that's being abusive. So what a lot of times happen is, is people will like be kind of overactive in their heart center and overly compassionate and, and lacking self-worth, they won't like defend themselves. So there are um, flower essences, and we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the basic kind of strategy you use for this, but there are things that you can do to help rebuild these energies and help heal these emotional wounds that help to restore people back to a, a base of energy center. No, I, someone got that wrong. The heart is the mercy center and the thymus is the judgment center. The, the, those two spheres on the tree of life are mercy and judgment. And, um, and the heart sits over the mercy center and the thymus over the, is the judgment center. Now the throat center is where we have communion, communication. Communication or communion is the balance between those two forces. Um, in other words, uh, just like the, the, the navel represents a point of balance between pain and pleasure, between um, uh, assimilation and elimination, this represents a balance point between uh, basically, uh, you know, pushing people away, judgment, and also having mercy. So it represents our ability to connect also our head and our heart. In other words, the throat links the mental center to the emotional center, and so it allows us to express what we think and express what we feel. 
and it allows us to create a sense of communion or understanding that allows us to create relationships that where um, we can have a healthy respect for one another's uh, boundaries and we can also be um, open to it. Uh, so this is a, a, a important center. When, when I've checked this and this center has been blocked in a person, generally speaking, they're afraid to speak up for themselves. They're afraid to communicate what they think or what they feel. Their self-expression is blocked and they don't feel they have a right to their own voice to be heard um, and be understood. So if we take and we move this whole concept up um, one step further, we come into the mental world. Um, and the um, um, in the mental world, we have, again, the same three patterns, only because the right and left brain switch. In other words, they control the opposite side of the body. I basically have them represented as reversed. Uh, uh, and basically, the um, uh, left brain controlling the right side of the body becomes the uh, the yang or separation center and the right brain controlling the left side of the body becomes the connection center. So if you look at those things that I put earlier about the right and left brain, you'll see this, uh, again, dichotomy between what is pushing things away and what is pulling things together in the body. It's just raising the same kind of energy process into a higher uh, uh, form, uh, a more subtle or uh, more refined form, because now we're not, not talking about social things anymore, we're talking about ideas, we're talking about concepts, we're talking about information rather than uh, people. So this is in our skull cavity, it houses our intellect, this is where we have self-control, uh, observation, analysis, creativity, um, you can think of it as the, the parent or, or the superego. So the left brain really is the part of us that allows us to be rational. So if you think about this, um, logic allows us to look at something and say, that doesn't make sense. You know, uh, that it allows us to classify things, put them in boxes. So we basically, oh, this is this, this is different from that, that's different from this. It allows us to put labels on that, okay? This is blue, that's green, okay? It's a label. Then that that label separates things, makes things distinct. Um, before I took field botany, kind of leaves were leaves. When I started taking botany and they started giving me all these labels, I found out leaves were simple and compound, and they were pinnate and palmate, and they were uh, and they had had and had margins, and they had all the different shapes. And by being able to to create labels for all of those different shapes of leaves, you started to see that this leaf is different from that leaf, and that leaf is different from this leaf, and you start to categorize that. That's part of the, the left brain learning mode. I, I've read that Eskimos have 30 different words for snow, whereas a person living in a warm, sunny climate, snow is snow. But to the Eskimos, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of snow, and so that by creating labels, you differentiate those different kinds of snow, and that actually enables you to now, you know, communicate. You have hard, crusty, you know, snow. You have slushy snow. You have powdery snow. You have so on and so forth. So this helps us make sense of the world. It helps us organize and observe and categorize things, okay, and gives us some mental control over the emotional side of ourselves. But on the other side, the right brain basically does the opposite. The right brain allows us to go, oh, wait a minute. I see a connection here. I see a likeness here. I see a similarity here. This is where art and um, uh, uh, poetry come in. When I say my love is like the red, red rose, if I look at that from a logical point of view, it makes no sense at all. Uh, my my girlfriend looks nothing like a rose. She's not the color of a rose. She's not the shape of a rose. She's not the 
the <laughs> she doesn't have anything physically in common with the rose. We're talking about a quality that is seen in the other side of the brain that's an abstraction called beauty. What is beauty? How do you define beauty? How do you measure beauty? How do you? It's seen as a, a intangible connection. That's where where creativity comes, and it's also where we see the big picture. It's where we see how that piece we just saw fits back into the greater whole. How it is interconnected with other ideas, and so this is also where we have the mental perception of our emotional realm. So what I'm showing you is this whole holographic nature of these three energies that I talked about in the beginning represent themselves in these three different worlds and they also represent themselves as things from the past or things you know projected in the future. And so you can kind of start to get this reading of how things are functioning on different levels depending on where people have pains or where people have discomforts or where people have aches and so forth. And um, it really you know, helps you kind of understand the body. Now, in the middle of the forehead, we have an energy center that's traditionally been called the third eye. Um, and that has been connected with the idea of the pineal gland and the ability to receive intuition or inspiration from a higher source that goes beyond our senses. And basically, it's the idea of being able to see the forest and the trees simultaneously to integrate everything. In other words, to create the balance between the piece and the whole and pull that all together into that kind of aha of seeing it completely. Um, when I mentioned that um, I woke up you know, one morning and all this just cause came downloaded to me, I saw it instantly, both the pieces and the whole. <laughs> and and that's what kind of knowledge this represents. It's a it's a, a a knowing that goes beyond being able to label or beyond being able to associate. It's a, it's a knowledge that really sees it for everything that it is. So um, my experience when this particular energy center tests weak, the person doesn't want to see things clearly, um, or in some cases they're actually. Um, experiencing kind of spiritual gifts and intuition, but they're afraid of it because they're afraid of what other people will think of it if they they do this. Now, there are three more energy centers, and these three other energy centers that make the total of 12 basically have to do with the body as a whole. Uh, they're beyond these three worlds. They're basically the 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 same concept of the expansion, contraction, and equilibrium in the the in, entirety of the system. So the one at the bottom, which is right over the pubic area, is the root center. This is where um, we have sexuality and eliminative functions. But this is where we're grounded to the physical world. This is basically um, the energy center that deals with safety and security and our connection to the physical world, being able to put down roots in the physical world. If you think of our legs as being like roots going into the ground, um, this basically is a center that puts roots down to connect us to the earth. Um, the one above it, which we mentioned earlier, is the navel center, and that connects with the archetypal nurturing of mother. This connects with the archetypal uh, protection of father, the idea that the, of masculine energy is protecting you. When, mas when you feel protected by masculine energy, you are able to put down roots. You're able to feel safe. You're able to feel secure. You have a sense of safety and security. Um, and so uh, ab abuse, all, all of the emotional issues that show up in this energy center have to do with being abused. Um, with being violated, not feeling protected. Uh, uh, the one above that ha has to do with feeling neglected. Abuse and neglect are, are two different things. One is is violating you, the other one is failing to meet your needs. And the, the feeling violated is basically feeling I didn't have masculine protection, the other one is feeling I didn't have feminine nurturing. So. At the top, opposite that, is um, the crown center, which is right over the tough, the soft spot on the skull. The, the root center actually comes, uh, that energy actually is between your legs. It actually comes out 
you know, between your, right, right in that area between your legs. This one comes out right on top of your head, this, this particular energy center. Um, it's where the soft spot is um, that closes after you're born, and many people actually mystically believe that that's where the spirit or soul enters the body. But anyway, I found this one represents whether you're actually present in the physical world and how basically much life animation or life energy you have in the, in the body. And it also represents our ability to connect to the spiritual or higher realms, where the other one represents our ability to connect with the earth. Um, people who have disturbances at this place are beside themselves. They're out of it. They're disconnected. They're spaced out. They're not present is the best way I can explain it. And then smack dab in the center of gravity of the body uh, is the solar plexus, which is the actual, uh, supposed to be the physical center of gravity in the body. It's also where the adrenal glands sit, and it basically represents the ability to be centered, to have balance between all of this. In other words, literally, to keep the whole system of everything we just talked about in balance. Um, and be able to connect to the inner self. So I connect with the, the outer world, I connect with the divine spiritual world, and I connect to myself. Um, and um, the, um, so basically, this basically is being calm, confident, uh, and self-aware. So um, I want to finish this up by talking a little bit. Of, I mean, I've basically given you the map. That I, I that I use to read this, and I like I said I I use um, muscle testing predominantly to uh, to, uh, to when I was first doing this to check these energy centers. As I got better at it, I started to just by looking at people's health problems, by looking at just the way people carried themselves and that sort of thing. I actually um, was able to um, see. Uh, I, I can see these things a little more readily without even having to muscle test people sometimes, but but um, it just uh, it, it it just started again. To, that I just over and over again saw that these things happen in these different areas. So, what is emotional healing? If we're going to heal these things, let me explain first of all that emotional healing is not about making negative emotions or experiences go away. You, you you're you're not going to make them go away. Um, it's basically learning to process the emotions, to basically confront them, face them, uh, accept them, and deal with them so that you are in control. You control them. They don't control you. What you face and acknowledge, you can take control of. What you run away from and dodge and hide from controls you. So Emotional healing is actually about bringing the emotions and the trauma that's associated with them kind of into the light. Basically, it's it's what you do in counseling. The stuff comes out. People start you know remembering things that happened to them. They they talk through them. They work through them, and so forth. But but this is helping to use tools that help to shortcut that process to bring about uh, the. Uh, the answer to, to bring about this in a faster way. So, like I would take and just uh, uh, hold my hand over each of these energy centers and muscle test them one at a time, and I'd find out which ones tested weak, and then I would go in and start uh, checking people on some affirmations or statements related to that. And I have taken and pinpointed issues that a person has. It within a matter of a, of a minute or two. For example, I was just demonstrating this on someone one time, and I, I, uh, they tested weak over their liver. And I, I did a little technique called age regression, which is while I was holding my hand over the liver area, I said, okay, we're going to go back and we're going to say, okay, you're now 20 years old. You're now 15 years old. You're now 10 years old. You're now 5 years old. And at some point, it went strong. So I think in this particular case, it was weak at 10. When I got to 5, it was, it was strong. So I went forward, and I said, so you're 6 years old, you're 7 years old, and it went weak. And I said, 
to the person I was doing this. I said, so something happened to you when you were seven years old that made you angry and you haven't dealt with the anger that that brought up with you. And she looked at me and she said, I know exactly what that is. My my mother died and my father remarried and my stepmother was mean to me and I was so mad at my dad for that kind of thing and I've never really forgiven him. And that fast, with a matter of two or three minutes, we pinpointed a major emotional wound from her childhood. And so that's why I've, I've had people tell, tell me that they've gotten farther with me in an hour than they got with other people in a year of counseling because we were able to like go straight and identify the issue um, using this kind of emotional map and really uh, uh, put it to good use. Now, what really is happening in emotional healing is this. Um, I, I learned this from a chiropractor on, in Australia years ago, and it actually took me a couple of years to assimilate and really understand what he was saying. But we tend to, our, our natural inclination um, and, and the way we're hardwired and the way we're programmed to be is that we want to push away things that aren't good for us and pull in things that are good for us. In other words, we want to avoid pain and suffering. We contract away from pain and suffering and we move towards pleasure and happiness. So that's our natural hardwired inclination. What an emotional wound does is an emotional wound sabotages this natural process. An emotional wound is something that happened to us that basically caused us to pursue a course of action in our life that brings us pain and suffering and avoid pursuing a course of action in our life that would bring us happiness or pleasure. So we, are, we wind up stuck in a situation that's harmful to us and unable to pursue situations that would be good for us. And and that's the nature of what our emotional wounds are all about. So I, I base what I'm saying about this on a, on a scripture in Isaiah where he says, Woe unto them that put light for darkness and darkness for light, that call evil good and good evil, that put um, sweet for, for bitter and bitter, bitter for sweet. In other words, somewhere in our nature, and this, I see this as pertaining to these three worlds, you know, what makes sense to us, you know, on an intellectual level is light. In other words, when I read something and all of a sudden all these pieces start falling in place and it allows me to see things more clearly so that I, I get a clearer picture of reality, a clearer picture of life, a clearer understanding of me and other people around me and what's going on in the world, that's light. Light is truth because what does light do? Light helps you see things clearly. What does darkness do? Darkness confuses you. Darkness lets you not see things clearly. So when when stuff confuses you and confounds you and blah, 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 that's darkness. We have the ability to tell between light and darkness. We have the ability to, to see when something, you know, makes some modicum of sense or doesn't make some modicum of sense. We're able to judge that. Same thing with our heart. We all know what things people do to us that make us feel good and what things people do to us that make us feel bad. And so that's the basis of conscience. Conscience says, you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Uh, don't do to other people what you don't want them to do to you. So what feels bad to me, I should be able to infer is evil. And therefore I shouldn't do it to other people. And what you know, is, is good and makes me feel loved and, and is, is kind and so forth, that I can assume is good and something that I should do to other people. So we have that innate ability in our heart world to judge this good and evil. And then the body, we have the ability to judge what is pleasurable, what is sweet, from what is bitter, which is unpleasant, and, 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 and tell you know, whether something is doing us good or something that's doing us evil. Our gut instincts have the capability of being able to discern that. But from a very early age, we all suffer experiences that basically screw this up, that cause us to put light for darkness and darkness for light, call evil good and good evil, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And I call those our dragons. 
The dragon is basically an illusion of perception in your subconscious mind that because you had some kind of traumatic experience, it basically caused you to see something that actually is painful as being good and something that was you know, good as being painful. Uh, a, a very simple example in, in working with a, a pancreatic you know, energy issue with uh, someone I knew. <clears throat> her parents had been really strict and you know and sober and disciplinary people and in that ha family or household you got punished for laughing and you could even get punished for smiling so what is natural which is you know for children to laugh and play and smile and be happy was turned into in her subconscious mind through that wound, that abuse, okay, into an evil. So she couldn't let herself experience joy and happiness. And when we did the emotional healing work with her, and she had a breakthrough where she actually saw that that was screwy, that her parents were warped, and that that wasn't true, and she saw it, all of a sudden, this she started to chuckle, and pretty soon she was laughing, 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 just having this incredible belly laugh that had been suppressed in her for ages. And we freed up her emotional things to, to so she could move forward. Once you see through the illusion, once you see through the wound, and you see it for what it is, that it was a wound, and it caused you to, to misorient your goals, you automatically start changing your life to shift into a more positive state of being. That's what emotional healing is all about. So um, the tools that I use for emotional healing are, first of all, um, acknowledging, accepting, and expressing feelings in a constructive way. And I, I've written a book about this. It's called The Heart's Key to Health, Happiness, and Success. Um, that's primarily what the, the book is about. It's about understanding uh, anger, fear, and grief, uh, emotions we normally think of as negative, and understanding how they're really trying to guide us toward a positive result if we really understand what they're communicating to us. So um, just that understanding alone, that if I stop fighting my emotions and I, and I tune into them and I feel them and I allow myself to experience them, I can... Uh, basically start to understand what's going on inside of me and I can see through some of this uh, so, some of these emotional wounds myself and so that, that book again is called the heart's key to health happiness and success I also use a technique called question affirmations now, I mentioned you know I use muscle testing if you're not familiar with muscle testing I um, we uh, um, I probably should do a I redo a muscle testing video. Um, we used to have a muscle testing video, and I need to offer it for sale. But basically, um, I, I, you 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 isolate a muscle in the body. You you put a, a steady amount of pressure on it, and then what I do is I have people say, "My name is," and whatever their name is, like I'd say, "My name is Stephen." You check them; they'll be strong. You have them say, "My name is Jane," and I always give a name of the opposite sex so that it will really. Uh, make the subconscious mind freak. And so they say, my name is Jane, and they muscle test weak. In other words, the, the strength that muscle breaks because they just said something that their subconscious knows isn't true. So then I take and I have them make statements such as, I'm like if I'm checking the thymus center, I'm a person of great worth. I'm, uh, I'm a good person. I'm worth protecting. I'm worth defending. And when I find a statement, a positive statement like that, that their arm breaks, that they can't hold their arm up against, I know I found a dragon. I know that somewhere in their subconscious mind there is a belief system in operation that, that standing up for myself is bad. Standing up for myself is going to result in pain and suffering. And therefore, they are basically avoiding standing up for themselves, in a, believing on a subconscious level that this is good for them. See, that's the nature of the wound. The nature of the wound is that actually you believe that, that what you're doing is good for you. That's why you can't confront people directly on their stuff. 
you ever tried to confront someone directly on their stuff? It never works. And the reason why it never works is because you're confronting subconscious wounds that on some subconscious level, they believe that this is important, this is vital for their protection. Um, I was married to a woman for a long time, and she, the early part of our relationship, she was always telling me, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat. And I kept saying, you're not fat, you're, 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 you're perfect weight you know, for, for your uh, height and everything else like that. You're not fat. And one day she looked at me and she says, you really think I'm not fat? I said, no, you're not fat. You are nor your weight is normal. She gained 10 pounds that month. The moment I got her to believe she wasn't fat, she gained 10 pounds. Now, why is that? That that's the nature of dragons. See, the dragon says, that some for some reason I have to be fat. And when I suddenly believe I'm not fat, the subconscious mind has to make me fat because it has to continue with whatever the belief is because it believes it's protecting me from some kind of pain or suffering that I would have if I was thinner. That's the nature of all of our emotional wounds. That's what's driving all of our behavior. All of us have these things. None of us are exempt from them. It's just uncovering them and helping us see through them that's important. And you can't make someone see through it. They have to see through it for themselves. So what happens is, is that when you, you find one of these things, like um, uh, you muscle test someone and on this, they have a root energy issue and you muscle test someone and they say, uh, I am safe and that muscle test weak. Then I turn it into a question and I have them say, what would it feel like to be safe? And the, and the operative answer is, what would it feel like? Not what they think it, it would be like, but what would it feel like? A feeling is a sensation in the body. And I get them in touch with the feelings, and we process through them, and eventually they get to the point where they, they have a good feeling in their body as they think about being safe would create a good feeling. And once they make that connection, that I can have them turn it into an affirmation, and reorients the subconscious mind towards a new goal, towards the fact that safety is okay. I also use flower essences. Um, I find flower essences are really, really helpful. I, this is a picture of seven flower essence blends I just uh, recently formulated for Nature Sunshine products. Um, I also use flower essences from FES services. Um, and uh, I use them a lot because flower essences help break through a person's awareness, help them see what's going on inside of themselves, and help them reorient themselves back to appropriate goal. And I also use aromatherapy because it helps um, people get in touch with uh, their emotions as well. I, I often use aromatherapy while I'm working with people. So um, I'm going to be teaching a, a class on this. Um, I've basically given you the whole overview. That, that's the overview of everything. Uh, the class is just to fill in details for those of you who'd like to learn more about this. Uh, uh, there will be seven classes. The dates are listed there. It'll be at the same time that this class was, 6.30 Mountain Time. Um, I'm going to make a presentation of about 90 minutes in each class, and I'm going to basically talk about uh, this stuff in more depth, and I'm going to include uh, flower essences and more examples of question affirmations and and so forth. And then I'm going to answer questions as long as people want me to to stay on the line and answer questions. Um, if you pre-register for the class before um, February 1st, it will be $97. Afterwards, it's $127. Um, and then there's the phone number to register, or you can visit the website. My son told me that the, the, the class would be available on our website um, by the time this webinar was over. So um, we're doing it. The class will be archived. We When we do the classes, we record every session. When you, if you register for the class, you're given a username and password to access the class page. If you miss a class, you can download the recordings um, and the handouts and everything on the class page. And I always, for people who, who can't get the classes, if they email me questions, I always um, answer the questions. So I will come to question and answer uh, time. Um, and um, uh, Someone said, that, does your book have any of the question affirmations? And the answer is yes. In The Heart's Key to Health, Happiness, and Success, I, I, I talk about six emotional states. 
which are basically uh, related to the three primary emotions of uh, grief, uh, primary what we think of as negative emotions, grief, anger, and fear. And that relates to this model I just showed you of expansion, contraction, and equilibrium. And, and I, I list some sample affirmations, which you turn into question affirmations for each of those things. One thing you can do if you don't know muscle testing is if you get the book and you just hand the book to someone, and these are all in the appendix, and you have them read the affirmations. Just read them out loud. If you pay attention, when they reach one that is an issue for them, they will choke on reading it. They will stumble over the words. They may even kind of, you could see a touch of emotion arise in their voice because they if it's a really, really big issue for them, they will struggle to say it. So you don't even have to have to know muscle testing to identify it that way. Um, plus, the, the ones that I have in the book are just examples. I mean, basically, if you understand the general concept, you, you can... Uh, uh, do this. I, I, actually, I have a li list of affirmations for each of the energy centers, and I think I, 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 I'm leaving town tomorrow morning, but I'll try to post it on my website because I've made that material available for people um, for helping them. Um, someone asked, do you think that the fine strength fluorescence will bring up anger since the person does not stand up for themselves? And the answer is yes. The fine strength flower essence blend that I created for Nature Sunshine is designed to help people get in touch with their anger when they don't stand up for themselves because they need to get in touch with their anger and they need to realize that sometimes when you're being abused you should get angry because you shouldn't tolerate that. Um, the, the class is going to be less about trying, I, I'm, in the class I'm going to give examples of the the, the emotional wounds or the things that happen that create these emotional wounds in each of the energy centers, but I'm going to focus primarily on remedies. I'm going to talk about flower essences you can use. I'm going to talk about some of the question affirmations you can use, some of the aromatherapy you can use, and some of the general principles of handling those emotions constructively that can you use. Can the, these be used on children? Um, yeah, flower essences can be used on children of any age, including babies. Um, Will I be able to help someone after taking these classes with you? Yeah, that's the whole goal is for you to be able to help yourself and also to be able to help other people. This stuff is not actually that difficult to understand. The hardest part about helping other people is this. Any emotion that you have a problem with or any part of yourself where you have dragons and wounds, you're going to have a – it's going to be next to impossible for you to help someone who has similar emotional wounds until you work through your own. Um, so it, it's very important that when you learn this material, you always start with yourself because, quite honestly, as you as you work on yourself, it actually changes the way you perceive other people, and you're better able to help them. But the truth of the matter is, is the whole reason I'm teaching this is because I want people to to not only be able to help themselves, but be able to help other people. Um, someone asked about reviewing the three worlds of the senses. Okay, the eyes basically go into the mental world, and so you, your left eye goes to the right brain, your right eye goes to the left brain, so basically you have um, uh, that right-left brain dichotomy <laughs> um, there. Your um, nose corresponds to the throat energy, which is communion and breathing and being free to express yourself. The ears, you have a right ear and a left ear. You have an ear of judgment and an ear of mercy. And by the way, I have found that when you're being, when you're listening to someone in a judgmental way, you'll tend to cock your right ear towards them. So you're listening with your left brain. And when you're listening to someone in a more compassionate way, you tend to cock your um, left ear. So you're listening with your right brain uh, to them. If you're listening with your whole brain, you're going to, you know, focus straight on them so that you're getting an equal sound in both ears. Um, the mouth corresponds to the solar plexus. Um, and then the sense of touch corresponds to the physical world of, of, of pleasure and pain. Um, 
this is not what I'm teaching in the classes around the country with uh, Nature Sunshine. That I'm focusing on flower essences, uh, some about Chinese herbs, and, and some of the, the skills that I uh, have done. I have heard of the emotional freedom technique. Um, I've experienced emotional freedom technique. Um, uh, I, I've seen some benefit from it. Um, however, what I'm doing here is quite different than emotional freedom technique because my belief is is that you should have free access to all of your emotions. That none of your emotions are bad. It's learning to channel that emotional energy into a constructive uh, thing. And what I've seen with a lot of people practicing various emotional healing is I can tell that they have not healed emotionally by the fact that they become uncomfortable when certain emotions come to the surface. If, if certain emotions make you uncomfortable, that means you have issues with those emotions inside of yourself that you don't know how to deal with them. So for example, if someone starts to cry and that makes you really uncomfortable, then you have issues with unresolved grief. Or if someone starts to feel angry and it make, makes you uncomfortable, you have issues with unresolved anger. Someone says they took mountain pride flowers since a while back and it made them pretty angry. Does that mean I'm not standing up for myself? Yeah, basically mountain pride is a flower essence that helps you stand up for yourself, which is going to put you in touch with anger about ways in which you may be mistreated in way which you need to speak up and say, no, I don't want to be treated that way or I don't want to uh, tolerate that. Um, will you teach muscle testing in the coming class? You know what I'm realizing is I've got to do something to teach muscle testing. So if nothing else, I will record a video and upload it on the class page showing how to muscle test the 12 energy centers. And also I can show you how to uh, uh, check them some other ways too. Um, the class right now will just have the PDF files, um, but I may... I may post some additional notebooks and handouts. The goal is eventually to make this into a course that actually has a manual. Um, uh, but right, I, I don't because I don't have the manual yet. I'm not charging this as as a course with a finished manual. Um, if you ask someone a question and they look up to the left, uh, they're actually trying to remember something in the past. Uh, pretty much. Well, no, I second. Actually, no, they're trying. No, if they look up to the left, they're accessing the right brain, which means they're trying to, to visualize an answer. They're trying to, they're using their imaginative brain. If they look to the left, they're remembering from the past. Although one thing you've got to be careful of is that there are people who have switched hemispheric dominance. About 10% of the population, um, their logical brain is on the right side and their intuitive brain is on the left side. Okay, let's see. Um, if you take the emotional assessment, because I have a questionnaire for the flower senses, and you test for two or three, do you take them all? No. I recommend you take one, the one that, that fits you the most, because if you try to take more than one, you're going to precipitate a major emotional healing crisis, because you're going to bring up so much stuff up to the surface all at once, you won't be able to deal with it. That's the one problem that people are having with the, with using flower essences, is that they don't understand that this stuff isn't trying to make emotions go away, it's trying to bring them to the surface. So you've got to be prepared that you're going to, have to deal with stuff, because it's going to come up. Like you take fine strength or mountain pride or stuff that gets you to stand up for yourself, you're going to start to feel your anger about ways in which you're being mistreated, and that's good, but you also need to learn some good skills, which is what I write about in the Hearts Key book about how to deal constructively with anger. Um, do I think resolving emotional problems would help with reverse polarity? Absolutely. Reverse polarity is typically a problem with uh, emotions. With uh, It's actually a lack of thymus energy. Uh, uh, in or a sense of a strong sense of self, not self. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yes, you can buy the book from the website. Um, the Hearts Key book is available on uh, the treelight.com website. Um, Heart's Key to Health, Happiness, and Success is the name of the book. And there are some other materials I've been writing that are going to be up there soon. What do I think about using the compass with the flower essences? I think it works very well. In fact, I've had a number of people report to me that they got the same flower essences coming up on the compass that they got on my questionnaire. But um, 
but again, if it comes up with more than one, I would take the one on the top and do that first and not try to take more than one at a time. On the previous slide, I, I missed which one we were talking about. Would that include macular degeneration? Um, possibly. Okay, in an abusive relationship, is this where the abused gets stuck trying to make sense of things, trying to find logic in something that doesn't make sense? Um, okay, generally speaking, when people are caught in an abusive relationship, um, they typically have wounds either to their thymus energy center or their liver energy center, and sometimes also their root energy center, but definitely the thymus and the liver energy because that those are the energies that allow you to separate for yourself from things that aren't good for you. So what happens is, is that you, because you have wounds that basically make you feel guilty or bad about standing up for yourself or pushing someone away or things like that, you, you are sitting there trying to make sense out of something instead of just going, ah, no, this, I'm not going to tolerate this. This is unacceptable. So basically when you heal those wounds, a lot of times what will happen is the people who um, you know, are doing that start standing up to the abuse, and either that changes the abuser or basically they wind up getting out of the relationship. Um, if the, someone said, if the navel center is damaged, can it damage the throat center? Um, all of these um, uh, energy centers exist on polar, uh, on, on opposing forces, okay? So what happens is, is if you suppress one side of the force, the energy, it exaggerates the other side. So, for example... Uh, the, the 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 navel and the throat energy centers are uh, are on the midline, but the the solar plexus and the and the throat energies are are the are opposing energies. Um, so if one is suppressed, the other one will be, tend to become hyper, uh, and that's true throughout the body. So in other words. Um, that's kind of something I've got to put together sometime for an advanced course, but there are patterns that you'll see with energy centers being blocked, like most people, like I mentioned, who are kind of doormats or have allowed themselves to get into a situation where they're tolerating being a doormat. Their um, right side energy centers are damaged. Um, you have the opposite problem, people whose left side energy centers are damaged, and they tend to be very judgmental, closed, have a difficult time getting close to people, uh, enjoying life or having fun in life. I had one case where most of the energy centers down the midline were uh, shut down, and this person basically was kind of schizophrenic. They were they basically went from one extreme of you know blowing up and getting angry to the other extreme of being really open. And when we were doing emotional healing with her, she had, they had the image of, of, of being on a bus with everybody on one side arguing one, one way and everybody on the other side arguing the other way. In other words, they, they couldn't find the place inside of themselves to find the balance between those two forces of being open and being closed. So um, that's, like I said, this, this thing has proven over and over again to be really accurate. And, and they enable me to, to pinpoint things really uh, quickly. Would forgiveness help with emotional healing? Yes, forgiveness very much helps with uh, especially healing uh, emotional wounds in the liver and also in the heart. Will this webinar be available to listen again? Yes, it's being recorded, and um, and I will post the recording on the same place where I posted the handouts. And for those of you registered today, um, I sent out an email last night uh, of where the handouts are. I will up, update the memory li the mailing list and send out another email after I post the recording of the webinar and let you all know where that is. It's at modernherbalmedicine.com. Uh, so you feel free to, to direct anybody to, to listen to this uh, uh, presentation. The flower essence questionnaire is...
going to be available for sale on our website as soon as my son David gets it up. But um, the, it is available right now if you go to treelight.com, T-R-E-E-L-I-T-E.com forward slash quizzes. You'll find it there, and I can probably put a link uh, to that as well. How do you do the flower essences? Um, you take the, their homeopathic-like remedies that you take as drops under your tongue, um, and uh, basically that's what you do. Um, could you formulate a flower essence that would just make us laugh uh, and laugh, and all our pain would dissipate? <laughs> Actually, I, I I can I I do know a good flower essence blend for helping people get in touch with their playful inner child. Um, uh, I use uh, the primary essence I use for that is zinnia, uh, which is basically for helping you get in touch with the playful inner child. And I also tend to use, uh, let's see, nasturtium, and, which is for being overly dry, dull, and intellectual, helping you find more humor in play in life. And the other one is um, honeysuckle, which is uh, for nostalgia. Um, the compass, uh, for the person who just asked that, is the Zyto compass. It's a device that you put your hand on, and it does an energy scan of your body and then matches you to uh, products. And you can get it for a number of different product lines uh, from different supplement companies. Um, and uh, a number of people who are listening to this webinar own a Zyto compass, and uh, they recently put these flower essence blends that I formulated onto that uh, compass machine so you can scan for them. Um, I would love to do a guest blog class for anybody. Um, uh, so I'll, ha I'll try to ha remember this. I don't have a way of copying that down, but I'll, I'll try to copy it down later. Uh, and this is very similar to the chakra system, except for the fact that it uh, involves 12 energy centers instead of seven. And basically, uh, I was I was struggling to figure out how to resolve the tree of life model with the seven energy systems. And I woke up that morning and saw this whole pattern. And that's where this all started. And I was already starting to do emotional healing work. And this enabled me to get into things a lot uh, faster. Um, on someone asking about how long you use the flower essences, you use the flower essences until you start to feel better. Generally speaking, I find that um, in acute situations, flower essences will help you feel better after one to two doses. In chronic situations, you'll start to feel better in a few days, and usually after two or three weeks, you'll under start undergo kind of some major shifts and, and so forth. Uh, is there a line of essential oils I prefer? Um, I um, I'll have to 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 go and look at my sources on essential oils for that. I I have some companies that I recommend for where I buy products from on my personal website, which is Stephen S T E V E N Horn H O R N E dot com, Stephen Horn dot com. Um, and I'm going to make the affirmation chart available uh, with the recording for this web, web, webinar because I think it'll make this more useful for people if they can actually see the list of affirmations that I put with the energy centers. Uh, but I'm, I'll try to get it, that done. But if I don't, it'll, it'll have to be up next week. But I will email in everybody when it, it is up. Okay, well, I think I've answered most of the questions. I appreciate all of you who've uh, joined us for tonight's webinar. Uh, someone just said that they've been using the Be Courageous and they can't uh, believe what a difference it, it makes and what it brings to the surface. Uh, th that, that's really great. I've been hearing great uh, uh, reports with the flower essence blends we put together, so I know that there are a lot of people are getting some really good benefits from them. So I hope that this really kind of opened your mind to uh, uh, the the some possibilities, uh, and just you know to help you kind of see the con the energetic connection between uh, what's in our mind and what's in our heart and what's going on in our body, 
and realize that, that there's uh, this huge connection. We're, we're holistic beings. We can't just look at the physical body. We have to look at our thoughts and our feelings and what's going on in our guts, and we have to uh, kind of integrate that all together and look at the big picture when we're really looking for uh, true healing. Hope, um, if, like I say, if you'd like to learn more, that you'll um, consider joining us for the longer class and getting into greater detail. But um, like I said, I make as much of this information available as I can just here for you to go ahead and experiment with. Um, and best wishes to everybody, and good night.